This is Mrs. White talking today about Chapter 6, Communities and Ecosystem Dynamics. This video is going to focus solely on Section 6.1, which is your habitats, niches, and species interactions. Starting off, let's talk about what is a habitat. A habitat is simply an area with a particular combination of physical and biological environmental factors that affect which organisms can live within it. We like to think of a habitat as just your address. Now, your address doesn't give us too much information. All it really tells us is that you live there. It doesn't tell us why you live there or why other things do not live there. Habitats can be quite large. They can include um, a whole portion of a rainforest, of a grassland, um, of a tundra, etc. Now, within that area, we know that there are oftentimes really, really tiny living things. And those tiny living things actually make up something called a microhabitat. The prefix micro means small, so a microhabitat literally means a small habitat or a small home. Now, there can be multiple microhabitats within a larger habitat, and they can actually be very close together, even though it seems kind of odd to think that like um, these little teeny portions of a habitat can be very different from each other. They actually can. And part of that is because of something called a microclimate. So even though the habitat might all overall get the same type of environmental factors, like the same type of weather or the same type of rain, different portions within that habitat can actually vary quite dramatically. Um, I'm gonna go over that picture on the right in just a moment to give you some solid examples. Now we know that there's also something called a microbiome and these are actually relatively new. Um, we have communities that inhabit places that we never even considered to be inhabitable before. And they have really, really important functions um, compared to what we ever thought. So if I take this picture on the right here and I'm just gonna make it much larger so we can take a, a better look at it, we can see a few things. So first of all, micro environments. Each part of a tree, including those fallen branches, can actually provide various micro habitats and microclimates. So everything's in the same habitat, but depending on where you're located, lots of different features. For example, the micro habitat of moths might be dry and exposed to sun, but the micro habitat of a salamander might be moist and sheltered. And so we can see that even though they're in the same habitat, very different environmental factors can play a role in how they survive there. Now we know in terms of microbiomes, uh, in addition to the decomposing organic matter, soil microbiomes like the one shown in the picture um, can affect plant health and the ability of roots to absorb water and nutrients. Some members of the microbiome can transfer carbon from plants to fungi and from one plant to another. Others can carry messages between plants. And there are many ecological interactions, including several that are throughout this whole chapter, which are regulated by these microbiomes. It's actually really crazy to think that your stomach, your mouth, and your skin are all homes to microbiomes. And those uh, microbiomes inhabit and actually the inhabitants un, um, outnumber your own cells. It's just crazy. They play a huge role in your health. It's an extremely important concept here within biology and really important within chapter six. All right, so continuing on now, let's talk a little bit about tolerance. Tolerance is the idea that every species has a different condition um, it can survive and reproduce it. And when you're out of your normal range, you will be considered to be in a stressful situation. And we use stress to talk about like needing more energy to maintain homeostasis. That would be like regulating your internal temperatures, uh, making sure that your internal organs are functioning property, properly, etc. Now in this graph here, which I'm gonna zoom in, oopsie, sorry about that, let me zoom in here. Uh, we have a few things going on. So this shows the response of a hypothetical, hypothetical organism 
to a single environmental variable, such as a change in sunlight or temperature. Now you can see here in the middle, this is your optimum range. And what we're looking at here on our X axis is the environmental variable of being high versus low. So a lot of sun or a lot of temperature versus uh, not a lot of sun or not a lot of temperature. And then we can actually see the population size of whatever this fake organism is. And we can see that right in the middle, that is the optimum range, meaning that we're gonna have the most surviving. When we get to the extremes of maybe not enough sun or too low of a temperature, we're gonna see that that starts to jump, uh, starts to drop down quite dramatically. And we have here what we call the zone of stress. So meaning that um, it's gonna take a lot more energy to try to maintain that homeostasis that that organism needs. And unfortunately, you'll see the population drop because not many can. There's also on the very extreme end, the lower limit of tolerance, meaning that like none can really adapt to that environment. And then we see that exact same situation on the right hand side where we have a stress zone where most will not survive, but some can. And then there's a certain point where it gets too high, where there's just absolutely no tolerance whatsoever and nothing can survive in that range. This bell curve is very, very common, and we see this um, throughout all different organi organisms and lots of different types of situations that can be uh, essentially graphed for, I apologize about that, uh, graphed for tolerance purposes. Now, last but not least, we have niches. Niches are different than habitats. Niches describe where an organism lives and how it interacts with the living biotic and non-living abiotic factors um, in the surrounding area. It is much more specific than talking about just a habitat. Your niche really tells you within your location how you are surviving. So that brings in different things like food webs and food chains. Uh, it also talks about just your interactions with the environment. So if we wanna talk about where something is living, we would talk about its habitat. If we actually wanted to talk about its location, um, in combination with its uh, overall behaviors in terms of how it reacts with its environment and with other living things, then we'd actually talk about its specific niche. We do, we do oftentimes hear people talking about this is my niche and we use that in the context of like this is not only like the place I thrive in, um, but it's like it's my perfect location. And it actually does involve um, the idea of a biological niche, which is really where you're thriving. Next up is competition. There is something called the competitive exclusion principle, which simply means that no two species with identical niches can maintain constant population sizes. So this means when I go back for a moment to habitats, they might live in the same area and that in itself is not a problem. But the reason we say niche instead of habitat for this specific example is because your niche shows me how you are actually interacting with your environment. And that tells me the food sources you're eating, the actual resources that you need. And so if you're fighting for the exact same resources, we're gonna see some changes within that population size. We know eventually one species will um, outcompete the other for resources. And that means that one is going to be dramatically affected in terms of its population sizes. And this is also where invasive species may outcompete and affect the um, native species that live in that area because as they're competing, invasive species may not have any natural predators. Uh, and that can then mean that they would not have a population kept in check, which is extremely important. Let's take a moment and zoom in on this graph so we can just take a look at it and talk about it for the competitive exclusion principle. So here we see that two species of paramecium have very similar requirements. Uh, here we can see um, red versus blue and that solid, uh, solid line is telling us when they are both growing under certain conditions and the dashed line tells us when they are separated. So here we know when the uh, growth cultures were separated, which is those dashed lines, both populations grow quickly. And we have that exponential growth followed off by logistic growth. So that dashed on their own, they grow, 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 grow. And then eventually they hit whatever carrying capacity their population can support, and then they level out. 
Now, in contrast to that, when we see these two populations in the same niche, hunting for the same resources, and essentially stressed over the fact that they don't have their optimum, um, optimum, optimum environment, we now see a huge change within those lines. So if you compare the dashed red versus the solid red, you can see that that carrying capacity is much, much lower. The blue solid line is actually heavily affected. And so when they're both in the same niche, not only does the growth slow down, but because the red seems to, for whatever reason, outperform the blue, it actually drives the blue species to a point of extinction. So in the competitive exclusion principle, you're gonna see essentially fighting and you're going to see, and not fighting like literally, like physical fighting, but like fighting for resources, struggling for those resources. And what we'll see is that if they are the exact same resources in the exact same niche, then we are gonna see one most likely survive and one not survive. Now, there is also the idea of dividing resources, which can cause species to divide um, and compete for those resources. And it actually helps determine the number and the kinds of species in a community and the niche each species occupies. So let's take a look at this visual here. All right, so here we can see that each of the wobblers, which are a type of bird, and let me move this over so you can see a little better and sorry, bring that to the front. There we go. And we see it's simply one spruce tree. So it's the same habitat that they're, um, uh, living within and they um, even though they have the same habitat they actually have a different niche within that habitat so the habitat is the tree um, but the niche is a different portion of that tree by feeding in different areas of the tree the birds actually avoid competing directly with one another for food so this is a really good example of the difference between a habitat and a niche they all live in one location that is their address but their niche is within different food webs or food chains. So they're not actually hunting for the same exact food sources, which means that they do not have the same niche, even though they occupy the same space. This does allow them for um, population sizes to survive and not drive each other to extinction. And uh, it is a great way of showing how um, resources can be divided even in locations that seem very, very um, tight and close together. All right, so let's talk a little bit now about predation and herbivory. There is the predator-prey relationship, which can affect where prey spend time in one location versus another. And elk, for example, might hide in the forest if they are being hunted in open space, so you can actually change locations on that. And here on the right, we have another graph. Let's zoom in on that one and take a look. And we can see here the predator in blue and the prey in red. And we see that there is the direct relationship between um, as time goes on and the population sizes as the prey gets really large, the predators have more food, they start to populate and then they drive that population down. As the prey population hits a pretty low point, then our predators will die off and then that gives the chance for the prey to bounce back. And that will be a cyclical pattern that we will see throughout nature um, if left alone without any type of human interference. Now herbivory and plant relationships are also an important to keep in mind. Herbivores, which affect um, not only the um, size, not size, sorry, the size and distribution of plant populations in a community, they can also actually determine the place that certain plants can survive and grow. And so if an elk spends a lot of time grazing in certain areas, then they actually could wipe out that population of producers there. So not only do we think about like predators in this example, we have this cheetah chasing this gazelle and that's like very dramatic and we, we always think about that. That is predator prey, but herbivore plant relationships also can be very similar where they affect each other dramatically. And there can be changes in the geographic locations of certain animals based on um, overgrazing and uh, essentially wiping out that low trophic level that's needed to support any higher trophic levels. Moving on to keystone species. Keystone species are very important and if you're not sure what a keystone is, it actually is the idea um, that an arch is uh, kind of like this shape here and we see that on the top right of the screen and arches are really, really, really stable and you can actually create an arch and um, have that uh, 
take on a ton of different uh, weight without needing things like glue. So they're really, really ancient, strong shapes that we've used throughout mankind in building. Now what's really unique about the um, arch is that when you're creating an arch, and this is like not for biology, just in general, but when you're creating an arch and you're using uh, stones, like back in the day, and you can see that on the top right, they have pictures, but that arch is a beautiful example of this because that very last stone that's put in the center is called the keystone. And that keystone is the reason that that whole arch can take the weight. It helps distribute the weight of the rest of that arch. So we take that idea of a keystone and now in biology, we apply it to species. So if you are a keystone species, you are a single species that has a huge, powerful influence on community structure and your, uh, your um, ability to be in that community can dramatically change an entire ecosystem. So um, being there or not being there can literally um, affect every other thing within that community dramatically. So a really great example in California, especially are sea otters. Sea otters are known as keystone species. And you might be like, well, why? Well, kelp, as we've talked about in previous chapters, are giant algae that create complex ecosystems called kelp forests. And kelp is eaten by sea urchins. Now we know that otters eat sea urchins. And when there are otters, the sea urchin population can then stay in check, which then can allow the kelp to grow because it's not going to be overeaten. We know that for a quite, a, quite unfortunately, a period of time, um, sea otters were being hunted by humans and they were hunted to near extinction. And what ended up happening was that the sea urchins overpopulated. They then ate all of the kelp, getting rid of the kelp forests. And the ultimate result of that was that there was no place for fish, seabirds, and other species to live, which essentially killed them off or forced them to emigrate out of that location. And so that one otter species was hugely important to maintaining that huge ecosystem. And we can see here on the left when it's in play versus on the right when it's absent. And once we remove that huge keystone in the center, the, everything else just collapses in on itself. So keystone species um, in themselves don't seem like a huge deal, but once we remove them, huge, 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 huge um, impact. Now you might be thinking, well, aren't all producers keystone species? Yes, producers are keystones within our um, environments, but a keystone species is a little different because it's talking about just one specific example within one food chain or food web, actually not food chain, in, in, in terms of one food web. So producers are important and they are keystones, but I don't want you to think that automatically producers all fall under a keystone species category because they don't. It's talking about specific examples in this case. This picture also is a great example if you zoom in because there's just some really subtle details here of like the picture actually shows you the different organisms that are affected. So we see that these otters and these sea urchins here play a role, which then play a role in the starfish, which play a role on the uh, sea snails, which then play a role on the different fish that are in there, which play a role on the kelp, which play a role on the crabs, which also play a role on uh, I can't tell what that is, but on every other living organism within that area. Okay, so very, very important. And there are a lot of examples. Um, the otters are just the ones that our books talk about and are directly applicable in California since we have seen that happen within California. Finishing off section 6.1, just talking about symbiosis. There are three main types of symbiotic relationships that we see in nature. Symbiosis just means living together. So when you're living together or close by with other organisms, there are the three categories below that we can categorize you as. In commensalism, and I have a plus and a zero, meaning that there is a positive and then a neutral um, situation going on, we know that one organism benefits the, uh, while the other is not affected at all. So it's not helped or harmed. An example of this is on the top right where we have whales. Whales actually have barnacles attached to them. And barnacles look kind of like these um, large shells and they attach to the whales uh, on the flippers, on the bodies, on the heads. They're just all over the place. They actually also attach to lots of other living things, but this is just one example. And by being attached to the whale, it doesn't really affect it at all. 
Um, it's not help, it's not harm, they're just there. But the barnacles, which normally can't really move very much, can actually now go for a ride on those whales. And by um, essentially being sw uh, the whale swimming through the ocean, barnacles now can get all these random food particles along the way. So they get to eat the food, they're benefiting, but the whale in turn is not helped or harmed, it's neutral. Mutualism, on the other hand, is where both species benefit from this relationship, which is why I have a plus plus. For example, on the right, we have clownfish. Now, clownfish and anemones are a beautiful example of mutualism. Anemones are, um, uh, on the right there, normally uh, very, very toxic. They can actually sting different animals, and when they sting them, they can then help consume them. Clownfish, however, are immune to the stings. And so because of that, the clownfish can actually get protection from other organisms that are trying to eat it. And then the clownfish then can end up bringing food to the anemone. So on one hand, you have protection. On the other hand, you have food. And now both equally benefit from each other and neither are harmed. Um, it's not neutral. They both get something out of it last example is parasitism and this is where one benefits and one is harmed in this case here keep in mind that generally the goal of a parasitic relationship is to not kill the host it's just to weaken it um, the goal isn't to actually weaken it but it's to use it and in that process you end up having some harm done an example here on the right which is so gross i'm sorry but it is a perfect example since it is something we do deal with uh, humans and other organisms um, like dogs, for example, are tapeworms. Tapeworms live in the intestine of their host and they absorb the nutrients the host consumes. Uh, the host, because of the fact that it's not getting all its nutrients, will actually um, be harmed in this process. You can become malnourished and over enough uh, time, you can then actually um, get very, very sick. Now, typically, uh, parasites don't try to kill the host because if the host dies, the parasite dies. And so that relationship thrives when the host can survive and therefore the parasite inside can survive. Thank you for joining me for 6.1.